What makes a great fight scene great? What, ah, who has time for taglines? I gotta figure out the ones to watch list for winter 2021 in less than a week, but I don't wanna close out a miserable, exhausting year with a retrospective on its most miserable, exhausting anime. So while the iron still lukewarmish for end of year listicles. I'm Jeff Thu, this is Animelee, and today we're running through a ranking of my favorite anime fights of 2020. Spoilers ahead for pretty much any show I mention, obviously. Can't really talk about good fights without saying why they happen or what happens in them. Like my OP rankings, this list is by no means meant to be comprehensive or definitive. I'm not caught up on Black Clover, Fire Force, One Piece, Boruto, or a lot of other things that definitely deserve recognition for their fights. I even fell off My Hero Academia because I read ahead and just could not make it through the Yakuza arc twice. It is too long. But I've still watched a lot of fun anime with fun fights this year, and I just want to share some of that fun with you. Now, not all great anime battles have to be, you know, battles. Some shows can match the best action anime out there in terms of strategery, emotional stakes, tension, and dramatic conflict without ever actually throwing a punch. Look, my list, my rules. Kaguya-sama Love is War is one such non-battle battle anime, and in 10th place, my favorite non-battle battle of its second season is the game where you can pump pump it as much as you want, but you have to pump it at least once, and whoever makes it bust loses. Hold up, YouTube, don't demonetize me, bro. I'm talking about a balloon. But it's also a real good dick joke. Did I put this on the list just so I could repeat that joke? Maybe, but also they picked it as the season finale for good reason. It gives every character a chance to put everything they've learned over the course of the series to the test, like Kaguya's self-calming ritual and Ishigami's newfound confidence from the sports festival. And that test definitively proves that all of their hard-earned character growth means absolutely nothing in the face of big thing make loud noise. But these characters are at their best when pushed into rabid desperation anyway, and boy does this whole bit deliver on that. The pump pump game is very technically a fight, deal with it, and more importantly, it's really, really funny. All that quality innuendo at the start is just the tip of the iceberg. With all of the season's emotional character arcs tied off in a satisfying manner before this skit even begins, it's free to just go ham with the comedy, reminding us of exactly why we love these characters and exactly what is still horribly, horribly wrong with them. There are certainly more strategic, psychological fights from this season that I could have picked instead, but this is kind of a perfect epilogue, and also a perfect dick joke. Truly masterful. Next up, Winter's only good cyberpunk thing, Akudama Drive, is also more of a psychological thriller than pure action anime, so despite the terrifying lethality of its all-super-criminal cast, it's not actually all that heavy on big brawls. The ones it does have are pretty fucking extra in terms of direction and staging, though, none more so than my ninth place pick, the final brawl between Brawler, the Akudama who lives to fight, and Executioner, the thinly veiled metaphor for a Japanese prosecutor who lives to kill Akudama. Which isn't the final brawl of the series, to be clear, but it is theirs. The two have pushed each other well past their respective breaking points over the last few episodes, wounding each other's pride as killers as well as each other's bones and internal organs several times over. This is personal now, even for the normally detached super cop, but at the very end, all that animosity and even sense of duty slips away, and all that's left is the thrill of the fight. Two men in peak physical condition who fucking love violence so much, beating each other to death for no other reason than to prove they can. Danganronpa writing. You gotta love it. Neither of them is coming out of this alive, they both know it, and they're both going down swinging. The goddamn universe knows it too, setting a gloriously gaudy stage and ringing the bell for their last round with a bolt of lightning to a somehow still functioning abandoned ferris wheel, which, combined with the countless raindrops scattering all around them, creates some of the most breathtakingly beautiful shots I've ever seen in anime. Sadly, there's not a whole lot of these shots to go around. This fight is short and 
and sweet and simpler in terms of choreography than some of the show's other battles, which it has to be since it happens concurrently with the other characters doing other stuff, but like both men involved, it says what it needs to say as quickly, loudly, and awesomely as it can, leaving a hell of an impact on the rest of the series' plot and characters, not to mention any of us nerds who happen to be watching. Speaking of impacts, Berkuli's fight with Emperor Vecta from Sword Art Online Alicization War of Underworld left enough of one on me to earn 8th place on this list. Yes, really. You're not losing your mind, and neither am I, I hope. I watched the final season last month in preparation for a full review in the near future, and I just have to give credit where it's due. Though, in my notes, I did call this fight cool old dude versus sex creep Sauron, so, you know, not that much credit. SAO has some absolutely stunning animation and sound design, but most of its fights are held back by something or other in their story and execution. This is the rare one that gets basically everything right, though. For starters, the characters have personal, emotional stakes in it. Berkuli is battling to save Alice, the closest thing he has to a daughter, from a soul-devouring monster, and that monster, Subtilizer, in his Emperor Vecta avatar, well, he thinks her soul looks mighty tasty. With the Pontifex dead, Alice is the old man's last real reason for living, and his pride as a hero and her mentor is on the line here, as is his life. With its world full of fragile, sentient AI, War of Underworld brought back the anyone-can-die dynamic that's been missing from the series since Yui showed up, and as one of those AI, Berkuli qualifies as anyone. He is incredibly badass, but at this point we're still waiting on Kirito to be resurrected and fix everything, so he could very plausibly fail completely here without driving the plot into a dead end, which gives the fight some real tension. And he very nearly does. Vecta beats him to within an inch of his virtual life, using evil, soul-sucking magic to negate his time-cutting sword's will-powered, uh, powers. And Berkuli gets some good licks in even without them. There's great swordplay from both sides, but he's clearly at a huge disadvantage, and it genuinely feels like he might lose it all. Right up to the big reversal, in which he strategically sacrifices himself to defeat the evil emperor by cutting his past in half. Which is kind of stupid, but also so fucking anime cool. He can only cut back a set number of seconds, and he's gotta wait for just the right moment, so the whole end of the fight's on a timer, and he almost doesn't make it. It was almost worth watching the rest of the season just for that one edge-of-my-seat moment. Also, the aftermath of the fight, with Alice mourning Berkuli as he smiles down on her from the digital afterlife, is sincerely touching, at least by SAO standards. So, good job, Reki Kawahara! God, this game sucks so much ass. Might as well log out and go back to- Speaking of things I didn't expect to say this year, Bleach is back and better than ever, baby, in the form of a stealth sequel called Burn the Witch. The beautifully produced anime and the manga it's based on are both on the short end. It seems Shonen Jump has learned their lesson about how Tite Kubo functions, or doesn't on a strict publishing schedule, and opted instead to let him tell his story at his own pace through limited runs of chapters that are as long as they need to be, letting him focus on writing tight, compelling character arcs to complement his always impossibly cool character designs, instead of, you know, making shit up as he goes along and constantly repeating the same themes and ideas. We all know Bleach rewrote the Shonen Drip metagame, and there are so many drippy anime boys and girls packed into this feature film that I don't even know where to begin. On top of the two main witch cuties in their plaid-skirted uniforms with magic pistols for wands, there's also a council of powerful wizards representing different genres of music, I think, each ratter than the last, with the raddest of all being Bruno Bangknife, a swaggering jet-set radio street punk who casts spells using magic spray paint. And then there's the wide array of awesome, creative dragon designs, which range in shape and size from skinny broomstick things to a dog with bat wings to more conventional flying lizards like the Blue Boy Bruno rides. But the most important dragon for our purposes is Cinderella, an all-powerful dark dragon who serves as the final opponent of everyone else in a balls-to-the-wall battle that is my seventh favorite of the year. The majestic, crowned bird with wings of shimmering lace leaves trails of glittering star ash wherever she flies, and 
and that star ash explodes on impact, so that's a bit of a problem. To solve it, the Jet Set Radio Wizard hops on his dragon and tags the sky with a magic graffiti circle to trap Cinderella with her own blasts. And while that doesn't actually accomplish much, it is both one of the coolest things I've ever seen and one of the coolest sentences I've ever had the chance to write. And there's a lot of other truly spectacular animation to enjoy in this film. This right here is what anime exists to show us, and if you haven't already, you need to give Burn the Witch a watch. Next up, the misfit at Demon King Academy had so many memorable and hilarious fights that I knew it had to make this list somewhere, but I was struggling to decide which one deserved top honors. I mean, how do you choose between heart beating a man to death and then resurrecting him so you can do it again and again and again? basketball spinning an entire castle and then throwing it one-handed just to prove a point, you really thought stopping time would be enough to stop me, or, oh gosh, that's still just the first arc. They're all so wonderful and crazy. So I decided to cheat. In sixth place, we've got Anos Voldigod versus the concepts of restraint and subtlety a battle he wages vigilantly and enthusiastically from the beginning of this series to the very end. One-upping himself and every other anime hero out there at almost every single turn. Like any good fight, there's some good back and forth here. At some points, it does seem like Anos is slipping a little. The Big Demon Academy versus Hero Academy exhibition fight, for instance, is only marginally over the top as anime goes. Like, lots of protag kuns have beat OP rival schools that were also cheating. You gotta add something more to the mix. And it does make sense that the constant escalation would have to give way to more grounded storytelling at some point. I mean, how do you top ripping a hole through multiple pocket dimensions to defeat several archdemons simultaneously and win a rigged fighting tournament, all while your idle fangirl squad sings your personal theme song about how awesome you are? Well, you start with a nail-biting duel against a friend and rival who's your only equal in overpoweredness, throwing every OP spell and attack at your mutual disposal at each other before letting him kill your soul in a symbolic act to stop a massive race war between humans and demons. Then you have all your subordinates show off their OP magic for a bit, with your hot twin sister waifus fusion dancing into a super mega uber waifu before you use a loophole to resurrect yourself in a man that the series has gone out of its way to repeatedly establish is canonically impossible. And then, finally, you have your idle fangirl squad sing your other personal theme song about how awesome you are, buffing you and your rival as you team up to stab the physical embodiment of the concept of racism in the fucking face. In the end, subtlety is left lying in a broken Yamcha heap, and the anime world is way more awesomer for it. And I guess if you want to be a stickler for rules, you can say I gave the prize to that last fight instead, because it is pretty ballin'. If you enjoy incredibly one-sided anime action, but in the opposite direction, then you'll also like my pick for fifth place, the ill-fated battle between Rem, Krush, and the Sin Archbishops of Sloth and Greed that kicks off season two of ReZero. Because no, I can't shut up about that anime, and also, I don't want to. ReZero's always had strong fights, the time travel hook lends them a lot of great strategic depth, and even those that don't really play to that strength still feature fantastic storyboarding, animation, sound design, acting, and writing. The time loop thing also means that these fights tend to stretch out across a lot of episodes, though, since death only means taking a break to regroup for round two or three or fifty, and since all of the other fights this season still haven't actually been resolved, this most tragic one kinda has to win by default. But it's also fundamentally solid. It establishes the insane power of the new witch cultists quite effectively by having them wipe out most of the army that took down the White Whale before they even know they're being attacked, and it only becomes more insane once our heroes actually start fighting back. Regulus, the Bishop of Greed, tanks an attack that wounded the White Whale like it's nothing, while Lai Baiten Kaitos evades both Krush's skilled swordplay and Rem's deadly demonic flailing with manic agility. Both girls sit at the upper echelons of the series' waifu and warrior tier lists, so to see them so handily routed is both shocking and emotionally devastating. 
Clearly, these cult fuckers are a force to be reckoned with, and now we are personally motivated to see them go down. Villain introductions don't get much better than this. And that's not even getting into the fight's implications for the immediate future of the series. Taking the most popular, marketable character, and Subaru's most stalwart ally, out of the picture is a bold move that significantly raises the emotional stakes of the season, and instantly brings the upbeat tone the last season ended on crashing back down into the grit and depression. The horror and loneliness that makes this second act so goddamn good all hinges on this moment, and the moment itself is beautifully executed on every level, the perfect hyped-up reintroduction to the series' world and magical action. Decadence, one of the best original anime this year, played host to a fair share of its own hype fights. None hyper, in my estimation, than Natsume, Kaburagi, and their comrades' battle with the Alpha Gadol and Stargate, which takes fourth place. It marks the moment that Natsume fully comes into her own as a warrior and hero, the culmination of all her training, and the turning point where her master realizes he cares too much for the one-armed bug and best boy Pipe to let them die, even if that means he needs to rebel against the system that deemed them defective. There's a lot of powerful emotional stuff going on here, paired with some absolutely insane fight choreography and animation that pushes the series' distinctive jetpack and giant syringe gun action to its peak. And when their unexpected victory against the scripted lost story boss bugs the game out and unleashes an unfinished super boss on Decadence, we also get to witness the series' most satisfying city-sized robot fist rocket punch. Though, in that punch's wake, humanity sees only despair. Countless giant Gadol are revealed roaming the open plains beyond Mount Everest, each capable of wiping our species out by itself. This moment is terrifying and exhilarating, promising yet greater battles on the horizon. But, uh, in case the fact I chose this fight for the list didn't clue you in, it doesn't really make good on that promise, ever. There are some absolutely banging episodes and action set pieces to come, like a crazy robot prison riot and a cool heist sequence clearly inspired by Monsters, Inc.'s Door Factory, but there are no truly world-class fights left in the series. Kaburagi's much-hyped duel with Hugin falls pretty flat, and the last battle is just a big JRPG monster that they beat and then everything's fine even though nothing is actually done to fix or dismantle the evil, broken capitalist system that was the main villain. Still, that doesn't diminish the incredible hype of this fight one bit, and the core aerial action of Decadence is so good at evoking that unique, kinetic, frenetic Attack on Titan feel that that is more than enough for it to claim this spot. Of course, I couldn't make a list of cool anime fights without including at least one Shonen Jump thing. It is kinda Shonen Jump's thing. And Jujutsu Kaisen, with its rad, inventive power system and instantly ridiculous power scaling, did that thing very well, a lot of times, even in the span of just 13 episodes. The most obvious fight to pick is also the most recent. Yuji and Nanamine vs. Mahito is gorgeously choreographed and animated, immensely cathartic, emotionally devastating, and a major turning point for the series and its protagonist. But I personally had more fun watching Nanami and Mahito duke it out down in the sewers, so I'm handing third place to that instead. And I'm not just saying that because of the one insane Sakuga shot where Nanami winds up and punches through the wall, although, holy shit, that was cool. There are a lot of cool shots here, but it's also smartly written and accomplishes quite a lot for the show's narrative in quite a short amount of time. This is a flex fight, a battle that exists primarily to establish the capabilities of a given combatant, so they don't need explaining in the middle of the big emotional main event they're about to be involved in. Often, these sorts of fights involve a slightly weaker character getting their shit kicked in by a villain, jobbing, as the wrestlers say, to give us a baseline of that foe's destructive potential. But down in these sewers, we've got two characters flexing simultaneously. While Mahito, the cursed spirit of human hatred, demonstrates its deadly Cronenberg touch, Nanamine gives us a taste of what grade one sorcerers who aren't Satoru can really do. Which is a whole lot, it turns out. Nanamine is the type to be cool and collected no matter how dire things go, but he walks into this fight confidently with good reason. Despite Mahito constantly throwing new surprises at him, from tiny Cronenbergs that get not so tiny to its own transforming legs, 
The stockbroker turned actually useful member of society adapts quickly, outwits his foe at every turn, and delivers a decisive finishing blow to clock out just a minute late. Also, I must say that a cleaver-wielding salaryman who rips his tie off and powers up at six on the dot is absolutely peak shonen design. At the same time, though, we learn that this horrifying monster is still just a child getting a feel for its powers, and that even with all his skill, Nanamine can't actually kill it, and that resilience all but ensures that the child will grow and adapt to become a much greater threat down the line, or in, like, the next episode. Which is very worrying, because pretty much every move it pulls in this fight is already scarier than anything we've seen from any cursed spirit this side of Sukuna. Mahito is vitally important to the overall story of Jujutsu Kaisen and to Yuji and Nanamine especially, and this fighting debut instantly cements it as a force to be reckoned with. Villain intros do not get more memorable than this. Next up, in second place, is the final battle between the Turtles and Shredder from Rise of the TMNT. And before you run down to the comments to tell me that's not anime, I agree with you, actually. Rise is very clearly a cartoon, not an anime, and I would never try to debate otherwise, but that doesn't change the fact that this specific fight is as anime as it gets, and it doesn't change the fact that my list, my rules. We got crazy camera angles and magic choreography, we got sakuga cuts for days, we got animator-friendly mid-air collisions too fast for the naked eye to follow, we got a climactic clash between two contrasting colors of ancient mystic martial arts energy that's resolved with the power of friendship and family, it does not get more anime. There's a lot of lore and backstory behind this fight, obviously. It is, after all, the culmination of two seasons worth of character and world building and Rise's distinct take on the Turtles' setting, but at the same time, if you're familiar with any version of the TMNT canon, it's easy enough to grasp everything that's going on, instantly understand the differences between these Turtles and their past iterations, and appreciate how this battle gives every important character, from Splinter, Raph, Donnie, Leo, and Mikey with their mystic upgrades, to April in a rare fighting mode and even a surprise Casey Jones, their own moment to shine. I would know because watching it with zero context is what got me into Rise of the TMNT to begin with. The first time I checked the show out, I bounced off the pilot episode, thinking it was too goofy and episodic. But this fight helped me see what I was missing and how that goofiness could complement and even enhance the action and drama I initially worried it would undermine. And with a newfound appreciation for the things this take on the Turtles does uniquely well in terms of comedy and visual storytelling, it's quickly become my favorite iteration of the franchise, period even above the movies with the Jim Henson suits, and I haven't made it clear on this channel how much I fucking love Muppets, but trust me when I say that's as big a compliment as I can give. Anyway, if you're looking at the screen, I don't think I have to explain why this fight's next level. I love that it doesn't have to explain how Leo's teleporting swords, or Raph's mystic decoy Psy, or Mikey and Donnie's extending nunchucks and staff work, because we can just see how they work in the animation. I love how it manages to get emotional without those moments clashing with its zany, high-octane tone. And I love how concisely it wraps this story arc up while still leaving some juicy threads dangling for a third season that we probably won't get because as Avatar fans and Steven Hillenburg's spinning corpse know, Nickelodeon sucks. Now's the time for positivity, though, and this is near perfect as both an ensemble fight and a culmination of the series so far. But one actual anime this year did manage to surpass it, even on those terms. And that anime is Opere Ranman, with first place going to its final two-episode-long battle between the Trans-America Wild Racers and the dastardly Bandito gang led by Gil the Snake. I can understand why some folks were a little disappointed with this ending. It does more or less sideline the steampunk racing drama and action folks signed up for in favor of a protracted Wild West shootout, but I completely adored it personally, and I have some counterpoints to share. 
Firstly, on a thematic level, I think the derailing of the race by old-school Western violence reflects the conflict between Gill's old-school might-makes-right philosophy and the ever-progressing world around him and fits right into what the series is trying to say. Secondly, they do still cap the whole series off with some of the coolest racing animation I have ever seen, and there's not much point in following every stage of the race after this moment, because with this fight completing his character development, Opere's win is an obvious foregone conclusion. He still earns the victory, just not in the pure racing-focused way some expected and might have liked. But I think this fight is better than any race could have been, because thirdly, on a related note, it ties off every single character arc in the series in a satisfying fashion while giving every single member of its sizable cast a chance to show off their unique skills and distinctive strengths as characters, and it looks fucking awesome doing it. Now, it is worth noting that the larger battle with the gang is technically split into several different concurrent fights, kind of like the Sasuke retrieval arc or the Yakuza arc of My Hero Academia that I just mentioned, even if they are condensed into a single episode. TJ and Dylan cut a swath of carnage through a town full of goons, while the other characters face off against Gil's lieutenants one-on-one, -on -one, each of whom complements and challenges their unique skill sets. Jing Jialan's bridge-top martial arts battle with the Crazy Knife Lady is particularly fun and well choreographed, but even if you take issue with counting all of these as parts of one greater fight, the climax of this battle alone still outshines basically everything else this year. Gil is such an unimpeachable badass of a gunslinging villain that it literally takes the whole damn cast just to match him. And despite their differences in outlook and ability, in this glorious crescendo, they do all manage to fight as one, using clever hit-and-run tactics to wallop him with everything they've got while disarming his own deadliest attacks. It's just so fucking cool that after establishing he can cut one bullet in half with his katana, Kosame steps up to tank an entire chamber full of them on his own, protecting his whole crew as they stand behind him single file. That is peak anime right there, and everything I hoped I'd see in a samurai western. Of course, this is also a steampunk inventor saga, so I was also quite happy when the even more badass TJ and Dylan tagged out our titular hero so he could go stop a runaway train with his engineering ingenuity in one last dramatic chase scene that the whole gang gets involved in, while those two finally teamed up to finish their fellow legendary outlaw off. This is an absolutely glorious, off-kilter crescendo to one of 2020's most thrillingly original anime, and maybe the most fun I had watching any finale this year. If you haven't seen Opera Ranman already, I cannot recommend it highly enough. There you have it. Those are my favorite fights of 2020, but I'd love to hear your picks in the comments down below. And while I've got you here, I'd also love it if you'd check out my recent analysis of the best episode of ReZero so far, or my breakdown of the best fights in Avatar if you're still in a melee mood. I'm Jeff Thu, professional shitbag, signing out from my mother's basement.